Literature is the intellectual expression of human behavior, and when one speaks of Haitian literature, it takes a unique form of artistic desire. It transcends genres and languages, and it thrives into what many literary critics call a literature of resistance. Ardain Isma is a contemporary writer who represents the embodiment of such assertion. Today I'm sitting uh, down to talk a little bit about Dr. Ardain Isma. But for me, I did not know him as doctor because we kind of grew up together. Uh, uh, we start developing an, a, a relationship when I was in college. Uh, we became good friends. Uh, and we support each other on ideas and uh, what we believe in and how to move forward in life because at that time that when we used to uh, be friends and go into college this is the time that is Haiti was very difficult uh, as far as the way the political setup was and then this is where we develop a relationship to support the student that used to be doing a lot of things in Haiti. We used to be on our student part in, in the U.S. and then we had the student in, in Haiti and then we used to communicate with them and see what we can do to make them have a better future and then move forward. Uh, with that, we go apart. It's, you know, it's a part of life. We move, he moved to Tampa uh, on the north side of Florida and I stay on the south side. Uh, with that relationship continue to grow and then it's always out us usually very happy uh, to know about what is he writing uh, supporting him on any things that that we could to move forward and it's always a pleasure to read is uh, anything that he wrote about we met him in st. Augustine Florida the quiet town near suburban Jacksonville where he's been living for almost 10 years. Against the backdrop of a picturesque lush green lawn at the World Golf Village, we sat down for a conversation. I don't know why um, St. Augustine uh, seems to be the ideal place for writers. But like I said before, a, this is a wonderful town. It's a town that brings natural beauty, although St. Aug is the oldest structured settlement of the United States, it's called the oldest city in America. But if you look around in St. Aug, it gives you uh, a sense of you've been back some 200 years to colonial time. The beauty of the town and the people and the kindness, it's so quiet and laid back some sort of a backdrop of a mega metropolis, which is Jacksonville. And I like it, it's wonderful, and it gives me uh, some sort of air to breathe in the morning. And when the inspirations really come, it makes me feel like I'm a better writer. And that's why, you know, without a doubt, that's St. Aug, as we call it, and uh, is the place to be. <laughs> Yeah, so one other thing that we talk about is, is what am I gonna do um, in order to make uh, readers understand the importance of learning about social justice. I don't really uh, write about social justice, I speak about it, but it's not only um, uh, on the topic of Haiti but you know injustice happens everywhere and uh, wherever it is I always feel compelled to take a stand against what's wrong in society what's wrong um, to what they're doing to humanity really so I think that uh, since I was a child, I've always, I have always uh, fascinated about human behavior and understand why sometimes we do wrong to others and we cherish also our friends and families. So 
I feel sometimes I'm, I am at my best when I know I write or I speak from the heart. And I try to stay close to that every time I take a pen to write or I stand behind a microphone to speak, even with my university students. So they know I always, even sometimes I understand I'm off topic, <laughs> but I need to make a slight reference if need be on this subject of social justice. So this is, if you want to know about a brain, my brain of writing is social justice. Ardain talks about why his writing is an advocacy on behalf of the disenfranchised. Ardain was born in St. Louis du Nord, Haiti in 1959. It's a dazzling town on the northwest coast of the island. He lived there until he was 11. He went to primary school there. It was a private congregational school run by the Catholic Brothers. The beginning was quite humble, and raw poverty did not escape his eyes as he tells his story. One of the biggest problem for Haiti, and not everybody would agree uh, to me uh, about it, it's, it's very tiny, very, very teeny, tiny uh, uh, middle class of Haitians, highly educated, but who systematically refuse to relinquish their class aspiration and to do what's right. And what is right is to use the knowledge, the education, to put it to task when it comes to helping the disenfranchise of Haiti. You can't do both. Haiti is too poor to believe that you can actually build your riches to become the nouveau riche, as we say, by using the state bureaucracy as your focal point to enrich yourself, which is what's been doing over the last 100 years, even more. You know, uh, what has to happen in Haiti, as I've always, I always say it, even in my writing, I use uh, CSMS Magazine as a platform to express my feeling, is that Haiti as a country itself uh, needs a major overhaul, a major uh, reconstruction of its institutions and principally uh, the institution of the state, which is the state government. Corruption needs to be a thing of the past. Honesty in public affairs would be the norm, rather the simple uh, exception. People need to stop thinking of acquiring a government position and then to enrich themselves and their friends. So Haiti is too poor of a country to be exploited as such. Corruption is everywhere. It's not only in Haiti, it's in every society. But when it comes to Haiti, it's thing, it, it seems to me it goes beyond the what any normal person would think of when we talk about corruption. So my personal feeling about Haiti is to make sure that one day, maybe I may be naive, many of my friends would like to say I'm too naive. Haiti is doomed, is a basket case, but I don't think that way. Because I know I may never live to see uh, Haiti someday laying on its feet. But I know it may take a hundred years. Someday an organization will create some people and we will relieve the beautiful history that we made back in 1804. <laughs> Vend l'image de Che Guevara Certains même pensent que c'est un styliste Si tu 
souffre des marchandises, le monde est de marché. Les ouvres aux achats, c'est la loi des débouchés. Ils sont vendus Jésus, ils nous offrent le ciel et ils construisent leur paradis. Young and curious, he began to question the disparity between him and children in his neighborhood. He started questioning why he and his friends had the privilege to go to school, get well-dressed, and be well-fed, while other kids would roam the streets ragged. Some of them were turned into beggars just to survive. He knew something was not quite right when he looked around him and saw so many young children being used as servants in people's homes. At the age of 12, he went to school in Port-au-Prince, where the level of poverty was obviously far greater than what he had witnessed in his little town of St. Louis. There he met many friends and began to read about the various 19th century Haitian poets and writers like Oswald Duan, Antenor Firme, Edzer Villers, etc. Ardain then started to develop an affinity for writing. He was lucky to have the famous Haitian poet and revolutionary, Rasul Labouchin, as his professor of literature during the start of his secondary school years. Labouchin fled into exile after a brief arrest. Ardain was too young to understand why his beloved professor was gone but his absence marked him a great deal. Returning to his hometown of St. Louis during the summer months, Ardain Isma joined a group of friends to found C-A-R-L-S-S, Artistic and Literary Club of St. Louis. There he excelled in poetry and acting. Ardain Isma, I would say, I would say he's the author of the century, or, say, or writer of the century. He is I've known him almost for a year now, and I, I I haven't stopped being amazed by his work. Every time he posts something, every time he writes something, like his words are, he has this way of playing with words that capture your attention, that makes you want to run your imagination, like makes you imagine stuff, makes you bring, it bring you to another parallel, another word, another another world. He he's amazing, and. As like many of his audiences, he has captured our attention, my attention, and always like personally me, always up to date to what he's doing, always reading what he's posting because whether I like it or not, he always brings me a smile to my face. I I may be reading his work, it could be a story, it could be something about the about politics, whatever it was, I found myself always smiling because the way he plays the word, it's like I don't know, it's it's not hard to explain, but it's hard to express. And it makes the words just capture your attention and makes your heart bloom and bring you to another world, like I said before. But yeah, he's amazing. And um, an author with that much talent, I know he will go pretty, really, really, really far. And that's why we all hope for him to, I mean, we hope for him to go, I hope for him to go pretty far. And I mean, who knows, maybe touch the stars. I'm always a great fan of, of Ade Isma's uh, work. I'm talking about his writing because the way he took his time uh, to write whatever he's thinking or analyze whatever he's thinking, make you really want to read or whatever he's, whatever he's talking about, make you give, give you the opportunity to want to read him more and more. I have the opportunity to read uh, uh, two, of the, two of his books. One it was Alicia, which I, I grew up fan of, and then one of my uh, one of my projects with him, we were trying to put it on uh, as a script uh, to put it on uh, on the on the big screen because the the story it, it's captured me so much. So I asked I asked him permission to transfer it as a script. We're still working on that project. Maybe one day we'll be able to have the opportunity to put it out. Uh, the second one is, is the mid, I mean, Midnight at Noon. That with, the, with a title like that, I always ask him what you were thinking about. Uh, because I had the opportunity to do an interview with him on my show called Cinema Verite that I present on 15.80 a.m. every Sunday. Uh, with that, it's always like the midnight at noon. The title of the book always take me to another, to another level or make me analyze. Could you believe it's midnight and then it's all bright? Um, Ade is uh, as a friend. Uh, is take the time to capture what he wants to to say or what. Ever he wants to present 
uh, it's also a pleasure always for me to sit down and read what he has to say either in the magazine the the CSMS magazines which I'm a quiet fan of and also on his two books which I'm hoping he, he has a few more on his sleeves he told me that I'm hoping that I'll be able to read more from him in the future it's always a pleasure to sit down with Adi also to have a conversation because he puts you in the mood to understand what's going on either in Haiti the concept in Haiti or what's going on also in, uh, in either in the world or especially in our Haitian community um, is a as far as I can see from his family is a very good father he always support all his kids uh, his wife and everybody else around him all his friends uh, I'm hoping the future will be I'm always see a future that is always going to be huge for him uh, um, to say a few words in Creole, par contre, quand on prend l'information, ça y est, pour mettre en tête. in Miami in the early 1980s that Ardain found the answers to so many questions that had haunted him back in Haiti. In college in Miami, he befriended the late poet and ardent patriot Maxo Calix, and the two began to frantically reflect upon the deplorable situation of Haiti. Ardain's friendship with Maxo led him to many leftist intellectuals like Gérard Mitalis, Ronnie Modestin, Herve Floival, Gabriel Duchesne, Patrick Bosson, Abel Jean-Simon, etc. Through literary sessions, he started to learn about the true meaning of the class antagonisms in Haiti and around the world. He was introduced to the great oeuvres of Jacques Stéphane Alexis, Jacques Romain, and many others from whom Ardenne drew his, his brand of literary firestorm, a revolutionary quest for social justice. Through history and literary sessions, Ardenne was introduced to the sadistic nature of the Duvalier regime. Thousands of victims slaughtered by his infamous Tonto Makuts, Duvalier's henchmen. A university professor himself, in academia, Ardain's confidence in literary skill grew through comments of distinguished academics like Dr. Dolores Smiley of Nova Southeastern University, Dr. Joanne Davis of the University of Florida, Dr. Carol Coates, who was a professor of comparative literature at Binghamton University, New York, and many more. We have had an opportunity to work very closely together uh, at Nova Southeastern University and on special projects at uh, Florida Atlantic University. And this is where I uh, began to know uh, uh, much more about the Haitian culture through uh, the co uh, collaboration with Dr. Isma. Uh, it was very interesting to present an event at Nova Southeastern University on the uh, Haitian Revolutionary Movement uh, figure uh, Jacques Stephen Alexis. And it was at this time when he and I uh, developed this program for uh, the staff, faculty, and students at the College of Education, as well as the folks in the community, that I got a chance to know uh, a lot more about the culture of Haiti, uh, Haiti, the people, the environment, and so forth. Years later, Ardain published Midnight at Noon, a compelling novel, critically acclaimed, which draws sharp differences between the haves and the have-nots. Ardain says he has found in literature his weapon of choice in the struggle for social justice. Dr. Isma brings the characters to life in a way that makes you feel like you're a part of the people of Haiti's plight. It makes you feel like you're there. The beauty of the land and the reality of the living conditions of the poor and the oppressed. Uh, this novel was like none other that I have read. It is just outstanding in the way it's written, the flow of the material, uh, the insight, historical research, um, all of those things working together for this, as we call it, a masterpiece. You can very easily see the passion that Dr. Isma has for the country and for its people and the endurance that they have from the beginning to the end. Each page of this novel is handled with skill and educational expertise. It is a novel 
it is not just a novel, it is a masterpiece to be cherished and to share with others. So what I would say to you today, if you have uh, an inclination to want to know more about Haiti, its people, its climate, its politics, what makes it tick, so to speak. You should pick up a copy of Dr. Isma's novel and read it and share it with others. Arden also has several projects in the works, a new novel titled When a Lone Bird Cries, a trilogy, The Roses of Last Spring, and the first volume of his new autobiography. In Midnight at Noon, Ardain tells us the greatest maladies of our time is the quest to have it all, to kill without mercy, and to shoot our way to the top. Finding a cure for these maladies is our dangerous task.